You're listening to Kingdom Living with our teacher, Mark Byers of Calvary Christian Church of Royal Oak, Michigan. Pastor Mark is continuing his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. So let's join him now. Paul gives this exhortation in 1 Thessalonians, and he says at the end, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Do you know what that word comfort means? It also is translated 109 times in the New Testament. Of the 109, 43 of the times it is used in the King James Version as, I beseech you. Wherefore, beseech one another with these words. 21 times it is used, wherefore, exhort one another with these words. Three times it is used, entreat one another with these words. Twenty-three times it is used, comfort one another with these words. What the Lord is saying is there, entreat, beseech, comfort, encourage, strengthen one another with these words. What is he talking about there? He is talking about clearly, and you can read it later, he is talking clearly about the fact that those who are dead in Christ are safe and are going to be part of whatever God does in the last day. And they're going to be raised from the dead. The comfort there is not a secret rapture. The comfort is the fact that we have a constant, steadfast hope that those who have gone before will meet us and we will be together. Dr. Walvoord says this, The post-tribulationists have still to explain how the Thessalonians could derive any comfort, whatever, out of a post-tribulation rapture. In other words, if the rapture is at the end of the tribulation, how could anybody get any comfort from words like that? He writes, The prospect of the rapture after the tribulation is small comfort to those facing martyrdom. He says that in his book, The Blessed Hope and Tribulation. He also says in his book, The Rapture Question, to offer this as a comfort to them, if as a matter of fact they had to survive the tribulation in order to enjoy the rapture, and in the process face rather certain martyrdom, makes the exhortation of 1 Thessalonians 4.16, now listen to this, a hollow one indeed, if the post-tribulationists are right. Let me ask you to answer a question. Isn't it important to interpret the scripture in light of the people it was written to? Isn't that one of the first laws of interpretation? Who was this writer writing to? Now we know who Paul was writing to. He tells us it's the Thessalonian church. I'd like to read to you Five verses from Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 1, 6. And you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. That word is the same word, tribulation. Having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 2, 14. And you, brethren, became imitators of the church of God, which are in Judea and Christ. For you also suffered the same things from your own countrymen, just as they did from the Jews. 1 Thessalonians 3, 3 and 4. That no one should be shaken by these afflictions or tribulation, for you yourselves know that we were appointed to this. For in fact, we told you before when we were with you that we would suffer tribulation, just as it happened and you know. 2 Thessalonians 1, 4. So that we ourselves boast of you among the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that you endure. Now, let me ask you a question. And please, I'm not trying to be hard on Mr. Walvoord, but you have to understand that if he's going to be recognized as one of the experts, if you attack the expert and bring down his theology, you've won the war. Isn't that true? There's no sense attacking a bunch of secondary people. Let's deal with the top guy. He said that any exhortation to comfort to the Thessalonian church, if they were going to face tribulation, was a hollow one indeed. And yet, when you read the book of Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd, Paul says repeatedly, five times, you are in great tribulation, you are in tribulation, you are in tribulation, you are in affliction, to this you were appointed, you are now suffering tribulation. Are we to assume then that the scriptures that Paul wrote to Thessalonians were of no comfort to them? Because they were in tribulation? Is it hollow comfort to them? Was this book written for their comfort of no comfort? Simply because they were in tribulation? Let me tell you something. There will not be any lasting, effective comfort or consolation in any hope that is a lie. 
Let me say it again. There will not be any lasting comfort or consolation in any hope that is based on a lie. It is temporary at best. And people may say, I've got the hope of I'm raptured out of here. And let me tell you what, if they're wrong, they're going to do to every preacher that preached that false doctrine what they did to those preachers in China. Historically, you have to understand, we already have an example of what happens to people when tribulation comes when they thought they were going to get out. See, you understand that the church was teaching to China in the early part of this century, in the middle and early part of this century, that they were going to be raptured out before the tribulation began. And then all of a sudden, Mao took over in China, the communist purge came in, and all of a sudden the church was under intense persecution. And let me say this to you, I heard one report of a family, the communists came into a church, and the pastor was there with his wife and his children. And they took the one child and poked out his ears with chopsticks. They took another child and burned out his eyes in front of the pastor. They took another child and cut off his tongue. They then raped and ravished and murdered his wife. The last thing he saw was they burned out his eyes. And the last thing he saw was his wife being ravished and murdered. Now let me ask you a question. Can you suffer more tribulation than that? Can you? I don't think so. And they were all told they were getting raptured out. Do you know what happened when they weren't raptured out? The body of Christ in China took a nosedive. And the attendance to the churches and the body of believers went down to a minimum. And then they ended up with a group of very committed Christians. And then after they were committed, they began to build the church. And today, one of the greatest revivals in the earth is going on in China under the greatest persecution you can possibly suffer. However, after it hit, one of the pastors was walking down the road. This is recorded in books. I've got the books. He was walking down the road, and he saw one of his former members. And when he saw the member, the member crossed the street and walked on the other side of the street. And so he went over, and he said, why are you avoiding me? And he looked at that pastor, and he said this. You are a false prophet. You have told us that we would be raptured out of this. And we are here in the middle of this tribulation. And you told us that we were going to be raptured out. One of the bishops who survived that and was a godly man came to Corey Tin Boom and told her, Corey, we were told we weren't going to face tribulation. And now we are in the middle of it. And I want you to know this. Tell the world to prepare for tribulation. And Corey Tin Boom gave her life for that purpose. You can believe anything you want, dear ones. You can attend Calvary and disagree with me 100%. You can even be a board member and an elder in Calvary and disagree with me 100%. I'm not going to divide over this doctrine, but I guarantee you I'm going to warn you. I'm going to tell you what I know to be the truth. And we're going to look at the scripture to establish it. The comfort of the second coming of Jesus isn't that we're raptured out. The comfort is that we will be joined with those who have gone before, and we will be with the Lord forever. It isn't escape from tribulation that's the comfort. It's that we can suffer anything like the Thessalonians, but there will be a day when it will come to an end, and we with the saints and all of our relatives and friends and children will be joined together with the Lord. That's the comfort of the second coming. I often visualize myself when I get to the end of my days putting my arms around my children and my grandchildren in heaven and looking at them with my father and my brothers and their wives and my nieces and my nephews and we're all standing there and those of you that I have had any effect on standing there and saying we made it we're here and we're here with Jesus we will forever be with the Lord that's the comfort not escape from tribulation Paul said we were appointed to it. He told the very church that was written to, you have been appointed to tribulation. He wasn't then undoing everything he said. And of course, the big comfort of the second coming is you'll escape it all. Hollow comfort. 
Do we mean to say that the Thessalonians and all other Christians who have to face tribulation and trouble, who are in tribulation and trouble right now, can't receive any comfort from that section of Scripture that Paul wrote for comfort? Nobody can be comforted with that unless they're out of it. The Chinese today can't be comforted. I'll tell you what, if, if I were dying as I was leaving this world, I would be comforted knowing that I'm going to see my wife and children again. And if my wife was dying in front of me, I know I'd be comforted because I knew I was going to see my wife and children again. During the persecution of the Maccabees in around 160 or something like that B.C., the Jewish persecution under Antiochus Epiphanes, there was a woman that he brought before him to renounce the God of Israel and Jehovah and bow to the gods of Greek, I think it was. She wouldn't bow. She had seven sons. This is recorded in the book of Josephus. And he said to her, you either bow or I'm going to fry every one of your sons alive in front of you. Now go tell your sons to bow and you bow or you're going to die. So she went to her sons. You know what she said to them? She gave them this comfort. Don't bow. We will be together with our God very soon. So they took a huge pan that they had made for this purpose and fried one son to death. Then they took a second son and fried him to death. Took a third son and fried him to death. Took a fourth son and fried him to death until they had literally fried every son to death. They wouldn't bow and then they fried her to death. You know something? You know what the Bible says, dear ones? Don't fear him that can kill the body. Fear him who can kill the body and put the soul in hell. Had they denied their Savior, denied the Messiah, denied Jehovah, they'd have gone to hell. And a frying pan wouldn't be compared to what they were suffering. The comfort of Scripture is, no matter what the world does to the saints of God, we know there's a resurrection, and we know we're going to be together, and we know we're going to be with the Lord, and we cannot suffer enough to eliminate that. The idea that the only comfort in Scripture is if we escape tribulation, is nothing short of a bold-faced lie. All through the Word of God, there was tremendous comfort in the midst of trial. It says of Peter, tradition says, that when they were escorting Peter into the arena to be crucified, which he was promised by Jesus he would be, he said, don't crucify me upright. I don't deserve to be crucified like my Lord. Crucify me upside down. Make it even worse so that I don't bring any honor to myself by being crucified like Jesus. These men understood that tribulation, escaping it, wasn't the answer for comfort. The comfort was the assurance, the absolute assurance that we would be raised from the dead and enter into the joy of the Lord with Jesus. It's a tremendous disservice to the scripture to say otherwise. Can it be concluded that there isn't any comfort for those who are not removed from tribulation when the scripture says, these things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulation. And what about this? And for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. It's been granted to you to suffer for his sake. My brother, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials. I am convinced that the purpose for the Lord giving us so much teaching on the end times is because he said, I have told you before it come to pass that when it comes to pass you might believe. Write that verse down. John 14, 29. I believe it is the key for understanding in times. He says, I have told you before it come to pass that when it is come to pass, you might believe. I don't believe we can have all the details and all the information and all the understanding of what's going to happen. But if we know what the scripture says about it and we're letting the scripture speak as it begins to happen, we will still believe when it happens. But let me say this. If you're taught a false doctrine and it doesn't happen you might not believe when it doesn't happen. Let me conclude with this. Alan Bichek, who is a, another, he is a pre-tribulationist himself. He believes in the pre-tribulation rapture. He wrote a book, The Pre-Tribulation Rapture, 
And on pages 94 and 95, he wrote this. This man believes in a rapture seven years before the tribulation. He says this. Paul concludes his description of the rapture with comfort. Why? Does he offer comfort because the church will not go through the tribulation? Let me just say this. This man is honest enough to tell the truth in his interpretation of scripture, in this scripture anyway. Why? Does he offer comfort because the church will not go through the tribulation? No. He says nothing about the tribulation or the time of the rapture. It is comfort regarding the fact of the resurrection, not the time of the resurrection. Be comforted in that your believing loved ones will live again. That is all Paul is saying. A post-trib, just as much as a pre-trib, can be comforted in that his loved ones will live again. Such comfort has nothing to do with the time of the rapture. Suppose for a minute that you had to go through the tribulation. You would still have the comforting thought that your believing loved ones will live again, wouldn't you? You see, even going through the tribulation does not wipe out this comfort that Paul is talking about. To derive a pre-trib implication from this comfort is as unrelated as grabbing an apple in a bag of oranges. Even a pre-tribber knows it's not true. And yet it's one of the cornerstone inferences of pre-trib doctrine. I want you to know something, dear ones. Let me read to you some scriptures in closing. The Bible says that this word comfort, that word is the same word as the Greek word that we get paraclete for the Holy Spirit. It's parakleo. The name of the Holy Spirit is parakletos. The word comfort means to call to one side, to call for summon, to address, to speak, which may be done in the way of exhortation, entreaty, comfort, or instruction, to admonish, to exhort, to beg, entreat, beseech, to console, to encourage and strengthen by consolation, to encourage and strengthen, exhorting and comforting, encourage, and to instruct and teach. That's what that word comfort means. It means, know this truth, that your loved ones will be resurrected with you, and you will all be together with the Lord. That's the comfort in that scripture. The Bible says that Paul went out confirming the souls of the disciples and comforting them or exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God. Isn't it amazing? In a verse where Paul says we must through much tribulation enter the kingdom of God, he says he went out comforting them. Where he was telling them they were going to face tribulation. I beseech you, I comfort you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Exhort one another with these words. Comfort. Now turn with me to this verse as I read it. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 3 to 6. I want you to see something about our God. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 6. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and I love this phrase, and the God of all comfort. He is the God of comfort, and we don't have to be raptured to get comfort. He is the comfort, not what he does. Who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation, that's the same root Greek word. In fact, the New American Standard in the NIV uses comfort there. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our comfort also abounds by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer, or whether we are comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. Right in the section of Scripture that uses the word comfort more than any other section, Paul is saying that it is in the middle of suffering that the comfort is applied. You know... This scripture is interesting. It says that he comforts us in all our trouble for a reason. That we may be able to comfort others with the comfort wherewith we were comforted. I want to tell you something about your God. Have you ever said to yourself, and this goes along with what I said last week. Have you ever said to yourself, how did I get here? Why did this happen? Why am I suffering this? I didn't bring this upon myself. I didn't do anything that caused this. Do you know that God will lead you through suffering to teach you comfort for no other reason than to make you a comforter for others to go through the same thing? Let me say that again. God will lead you through suffering 
to teach you how to get comfort. And then when you learn to receive comfort, he will then send you to comfort others who are facing what you're facing right now. So that you can comfort with the comfort wherewith you were comforted when you were in their place. That's what Paul's saying here. So there are times that you are sent by God to suffer for no other reason than a school of the Spirit to learn to be a comforter for other people who are going to suffer the same thing. And you've just been placed in the body as a comforter. One time I was called upon to counsel a woman whose son had been killed in a car accident. This was my first year of pastoring. He had been driven off the road by a car and his motorcycle in the town that we lived. And when he crashed, he was killed. And she had been going to psychiatrists and all these things and wasn't getting anywhere. And she was just grieving. And finally she called me. I was the last resort. She wasn't a Christian. She finally decided maybe God has the answer. She called me and asked me to counsel her about this death. And I hung up the phone and I said to the Lord this. I said, Father, I have never even lost a single person in my life that was close to me in death. I haven't got the foggiest idea what to do to counsel this woman. Therefore, I'm saying to you, Lord, you've placed me in the ministry, and you've put me in the front line of this battle, and no army would ever send a soldier into battle without the right weapons. I need a weapon. I need equipment, and I don't have it. How can I meet this woman's needs? I've never even lost a single person close to me in life to death. I was 27 years old. That day I went to a ball game, a soccer game for one of my foster sons, and I was 25 miles from the church. And as I'm standing there watching the game, a man from our church came walking up and who was 45 miles from his home to be at this soccer game where my foster son was playing the game. And I looked up and I saw him coming, and the moment I saw him, the Spirit of the Lord said, there's your weapon. Do you know why the Lord sent that man? He had a son who would have been my age at the time. That when he was the same age as the boy that was killed in the motorcycle accident, was driven off of the road by a vehicle on his motorcycle, and he was killed. And that father had experienced exactly what that woman had experienced. And the Lord said, there's your weapon. And I said to him, Dick, would you be willing to go with me to this lady? Oh, he said, oh yeah, I'll be glad to. So we went to the house. We went in, and I sat down, and I introduced myself, and I introduced, because she had never met me, I introduced Dick to him, and I said, you know, Dick has suffered the same thing you've suffered, and I just brought him along to talk to you. So she began to talk, and I just stepped out of the picture, and I let Dick do all the talking. Two weeks later, she called, well, she told us this, she said, you've done more for me than all the psychiatrists. Two weeks later, she was attending church, and she said to me, I have been going to psychiatrists for two months, and that one conversation with Dick brought me peace for the first time in two months. How could that happen? He was comforting her with the comfort wherewith he was comforted when he was in her shoes. Tribulation doesn't decide whether we have comfort. The Holy Spirit does. There is comfort for you. This is last verse. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but comforting one another, exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Do you know what the Bible says? That we are going to be comforting ourselves even more as we see the day approaching. And we are going to be assembling together more as we see the day approaching. You say, man, pastor, you're preaching and it's 115. I'm just being biblical. (laughs) Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together and so much the more as you see the day approaching, I guarantee you there'll be a day when you wish you had an hour and a half to sit and listen to someone preach. And so much the more as the day's approaching, exhort one another, comfort one another, as you see the day approaching, why are we going to need to do that? Because we're going to be surrounded with the greatest catastrophes this world has ever known, and the Lord's going to be preserving His people, and it is going to be the joy of the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit comforting these hearts as we get closer to the redemption and we're going to be saying, look up, the redemption's drawing nigh and the comfort is the assurance he's coming and the assurance that everyone who's gone before is going to be there with him when he comes. That's the comfort, not an escape. And that comfort has been appropriate for every Christian throughout the history of the church age and Thessalonians applies to everybody, not just the last day church. That's a false interpretation. Thank God he's the God 
of comfort. He is the comfort, not an escape. Thank you for listening to Kingdom Living, sponsored by Calvary Christian Church in Royal Oak, Michigan. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Just what comforting words was Paul referring to in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4? Well, just listen. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we, which are alive and remain, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. He encouraged them to rehearse this event in their minds so as not to be disheartened and fall away under the trials of everyday life. Let's also gain comfort as Pastor Mark Byers expounds more on this triumphal event in his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. We are looking at seven major cornerstones that are used by those who believe a rapture is going to take place prior to a seven-year tribulation. And we have been examining them in light of the Word of God, and we have been looking at them, realizing that they're not distinctive statements as much as they are inferences that they've added together. Quite frankly, the strength of their whole argument becomes weakened when each inference is proved to have been taken out of context or a misinterpretation of the Scripture. We have looked at the fact that the outpouring of the Great Tribulation will be wrath and that we are not appointed to wrath. And we have looked at that truth and saw that the scriptures used for that are not really fairly applied to the doctrine of the Great Tribulation. We've looked at the absence of the word church in the book of Revelation and in Matthew 24. And we have seen again that that's not a justifiable interpretation that the church will not be here because they're not mentioned in Revelation 4 through 18. We've looked at the issue of the comfort and encouragement of 1 Thessalonians 4 being of very little comfort if we have to pass through a tribulation. We covered that and also saw that the book of Thessalonians was written to a church in the middle of great tribulation, tremendous sufferings at the time, and the whole purpose of the comfort was the fact that they would be joined with their loved ones in the days ahead. Today I want to look at two very, I want to look at three, but I'm not going to get that far, uh, a very popular concepts, and I want to we're going to get into some scriptural teaching on this because now we're getting into more of the, the meat of this whole doctrine. The New Testament has a number of statements that clearly state that Jesus is coming quickly. And realizing that the book of Revelation and these scriptures that I'm referring to were written almost 2,000 years ago, for the Lord in his own scripture to say he was coming quickly would lead anyone in that day to seemingly think that that means at any moment or that his coming was imminent right around the corner. The phrase coming soon or quickly is used throughout the Bible. The word coming soon is a more modern translation. The word quickly is what the King James uses. A number of places where that is used is Revelation 22, 7. Behold, I am coming quickly. He ends the New Testament, the very last chapter in the Bible. Behold, I am coming quickly. Revelation twenty two twelve. And behold, I am coming quickly. And my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Again, almost the very last verses in the Bible. Revelation twenty two twenty. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming quickly. You have to realize this is Jesus speaking here in the book of Revelation. At the very end of the book of Revelation, the last New Testament book to be written. Behold, I am coming quickly. Amen. Even so, come Lord Jesus. James 5, 9. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. Matthew 24, 33. So you also, when you shall see these things, know that it is near at the doors. All these verses tend to suggest that his coming 
in the minds of the early church was very soon, very near, very quick. It was going to happen very quickly. How we interpret the word quickly or standing at the door now that 2,000 years has passed is going to be rather interesting. When it was written, he said, I'm coming quickly. To them, it would be easy to believe that that meant very soon. But the word of God that is still the word of God, the unalterable word of God, still reads, he's coming quickly. And he wrote that 2,000 years ago. Do you understand that in their context, quickly could have easily meant right away, soon, immediately, just, just wait a short while. The problem is the word of God that said to them, he's coming quickly, is exactly the same word of God that we read that is still saying he's coming quickly. The infallible, unalterable, true word of God, which still says he's coming quickly. The only problem is he's been coming quickly now for 2,000 years. Therefore, based on that fact, it is unquestionably true that the coming quickly did not mean in a very short time. It did not mean that he was coming quickly from our perspective. That word quickly must be relative. The question is relative to what? Maybe better yet, relative to whom? I shared some weeks ago when we were introducing this that, that Einstein was asked the question if he would please explain the theory of relativity in layman's terms. In other words, the theory of relativity is so deep that the average person just can't grasp that something can be relative and be absolute. He said, well, here's, here's an example. Sitting and talking with a beautiful girl for one half hour is not the same as sitting on a burner of a stove for one half hour. They are both one half hour long to the second, but they are relative in their enjoyment and their pleasure. One is a lot longer half hour than the other half hour. I remember when I was dating and I still look back in fond memories to those days of courting my wife. I could spend hours and hours and hours with her and talking and talking and talking. And they seem like just a moment. Kind of like Jacob. It says, it says that he worked for Rachel and it seemed as just a few days, you know, for seven years. But if you're doing seven years in prison in a, a communist country for your faith in Christ, suffering intensely, that seven years becomes a very long time. In fact, we pastored a church that was an intense, difficult church to pastor because when we accepted it, they had just experienced a split. And I spent six years in that church. And in my life, that six years is the longest six years I've ever lived. I've pastored this church now over 19 years. And it doesn't even seem close to being as long as that six years was in that other church. This church has been a delight to be part of. Actually, that church became a delight, but it took six years to get there. And by the time it was a delight, I was signed elsewhere by God's direction. The problem is, quickly or soon is relative. And here's what it is relative to. The scripture says in the book of Psalms, Psalm 90 verse 4, a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it is past and like a watch in the night. That very verse is taken up in the book of 2 Peter. And I want you to turn with me to the book of 2 Peter because we'll be in and out of 2 Peter throughout the entire service this morning. 2 Peter chapter 2. Peter actually quotes from this verse in Psalms. But I want to read chapter 3 starting in verse 1. And we're going to read about 14 verses. Let me introduce one thought to you from 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 15. Peter writes and says in chapter 1 verse 15, Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. That word decease means my exodus, my departure. In other words, Peter was saying to the church that he was writing to, I want to write these things down to put you in remembrance of them so that when I'm dead you will have a reminder of them. We'll come back to that verse later. But you have to realize that Peter is writing this book so they will have something to go back to to remember what he taught them. This is a, a book of remembrance. And so he says, Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle in both of which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder. Just what he said he wrote the book for. 
that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first. Now, he says, knowing this first. When he says, knowing this first, he's about to put down some pretty important information. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. I have a suspicion this may be Christians talking. Christian scoffers because they call the early church apostles fathers. All these things, for since the fathers fell asleep, since the fathers, the, the early church apostles, those who founded the church, have died, all things continue as they were, from the beginning of creation, all the way back to Adam, all the fathers, every man of faith has died, and everything continues the same. And then he says, for this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which now exist are kept in store by the same word, reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. I'll explain why he says this in a moment. But beloved, do not forget. Now listen, listen carefully. Read what the Bible says here. Don't read into the scriptures, read out of the scriptures. Don't do eisegesis, do exegesis. Don't try to make the Bible say something you want it to say. Read the Bible and let it say what it does say. Now beloved, do not forget this one thing. Do you have an idea that just maybe that one thing is a major key to understanding what Peter's talking about? I mean, if you're talking to your kids and you're giving them direction and you tell them, do this, do this, do this, and then you say to them, and above everything, don't forget this one thing. You know what you mean? If you forget everything else I tell you to do, don't forget this. This is extremely important. Here Peter is explaining the second coming. He's talking about the end of the age. He's talking about the Lord Jesus Christ coming back. And he throws in a statement and he says this. Above everything, he says, beloved, do not forget this one thing. And then he says that with the Lord... One day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. He just got through saying, in the last days, there is going to be such a long period of time coming that scoffers are going to rise up and begin saying, so, where is the promise of his coming? Do you think that somebody would have been saying that in A.D. 90? Since all the fathers fell asleep, John was still alive. Peter had already written this. He was dead. John was alive still. He was the last apostle to die. He hadn't died yet. And Peter says, don't forget this one thing. A day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. That is a key verse to make us understand the end. And I will explain that as we go. He says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, but his long suffering to us not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come. Now here is the famous verse. This is the biggie. This is the verse that is the name of a movie. This verse is so big, they've made a whole series of novels out of it. Based on this verse. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. You know, it's sad. We will look at this in detail in a few minutes. But that's only part of the sentence. Look at your Bible. Look at it for yourself. Put your eyes on the pages right now. Look at your scriptures. What comes after the word night? A comma. It's the same sentence, right? The sentence hasn't ended. Behold, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. What did he just say? A thousand years is as a day, and a day is as a thousand years. And the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. Notice this phrase. 
Hold on to your seats. In the which. Now, if English means anything, and if sentence structure means anything, when it says, in the which, it is referring to the day of the Lord. Isn't it? And if it doesn't, I don't know how to read. And I don't understand my own language. The day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the witch, in that day. Now, are you listening to me? What's going to happen in the day when the Lord comes as a thief in the night? The heavens will pass away with a great noise. And the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. Do you know what that just said? Now listen, please, don't listen to me. And don't listen to some of the authors. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible says, in the day that the Lord comes as a thief in the night, the heavens and the earth are eliminated. How is it possible, based on that verse, to make the assumption that there is a seven-year period of tribulation where the book of Revelation is poured out for three-and-a-half-year period and another three-and-a-half-year period, or 1,260 days or 1,290 days doubled, how is it possible that there's all those days in a seven-year period when in the day that the Lord comes as a thief in the night, the heavens and the earth melt away with fervent heat? Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. Are you all still here? That verse cannot possibly mean. It is impossible I don't care how you try to twist and bend and force that verse to fit a square hole. It's a round verse. And it says, the day the Lord comes as a thief in the night. That's it. Peter said, who was the apostle of the church, the one who Jesus personally trained and taught, in the day the Lord comes as a thief in the night. In the very sentence, not a second sentence, in the very sentence. The Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens will pass away with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are therein will be burned up. We'll come back to that. But if that doesn't shake, now listen to me. Those of you sitting here and those that hear this on the radio, if that doesn't shake, the false confidence in a pre-tribulation rapture seven years before the end of the world, there is nothing I could ever say that would even dent your armor in this area. The Bible says it, not me. And that little verse, the thief in the night, before the Lord comes as a thief in the night, is the verse where the whole pre-tribulation rapture doctrine hangs. You remove it and you don't have a pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. And yet in the very sentence it says when that happens the earth is going to melt away. The heavens are going to be destroyed. They're going to be dissolved. We'll come back to the thief in the night verses in a little bit. Because this isn't, that actually isn't the one I'm addressing really right now. What I'm addressing is Peter said we're in the last days. People say, well, see, that means the last days means that they expected him to come back right then and there. Real soon, quickly, like he said. But what did we say about the timing? We now know that it's 2,000 years later, so our interpretation of that cannot mean it meant real quick. Because it's still the word of God and it's been 2,000 years. But it's real simple what the answer is. In God's economy, 
relative to the way God counts time, Jesus has only been gone for two days. Because God says a thousand years is a day, and a day is a thousand years. And Peter, making sure we don't miss that, says, know this one thing. This is an important key for you to understand. So when Peter says, we are in the last days, and in the very next verse, look at it. Verse 3, knowing this verse that scoffers will come in the last days. And then down in verse 8, beloved, do not forget this one thing that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, a thousand years is one day. If you're a logical person, and Peter said, we're living in the last days. And then he says, and of course, a day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. If you're a logical person, there is only one deduction. There is a minimum of 2,000 years yet to go. Could be three, could be four, could be ten, but there's at least 2,000 years. Because Peter says, there will be in the last days, and then he says, a day is a thousand years long. If there are a plurality of days, if there's more than one, you have a day. If it's one day, it's a day. If there's more than one, you have days. It can be two or more, right? And Peter says, and oh, by the way, the days that we're talking about, they're a thousand years long. Are you following me? So Peter was saying to them, you got at least 2,000 years before this happens, and that's why scoffers are going to come. There's going to be 2,000 years at least. There may be more. I don't think there is, but I think that 2,000 years is right because it's, I think there are two days. You know, how many of you know this verse? After two days, he will revive us. And on the third day, he will raise us up and we will live in his sight. It's a little verse in Hosea. A little indication that the church age will last for two days. And after two days, he will revive us. And after two days, on the third day, for 1,000 years, we're going to live in his sight. So you see, there was clear indication in the church... And the Apostle Barnabas wrote in his writings, and they did not become scripture, but we do have his writings just like we do have Paul's. The Apostle Barnabas clearly stated, and you have to understand, Barnabas was a convert of Paul's. And I have a pretty clear suspicion he had a pretty good idea what those men taught. The Apostle Barnabas writes that the two days, that the creation of seven days is six days of labor, the seventh is the millennium, and he taught that the church would last for 2,000 years in the very first century. That's what he was teaching. The church age is two days long, and a day is 1,000 years. And Barnabas, the apostle Barnabas, the associate of Paul, wrote it down for us, and we can read his writing about this matter. The day is relative to God. When he said, I'm coming quickly, he was only talking about coming in two days. The day that seems so long to us is very clearly explained from the scripture. It's 2,000 years long. The days. The day is 1,000 and two of them is 2,000 years. Why would God do that? Look at what he says in verse 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. How big would the church have been if Jesus had come back in 50 AD? How big would the bride have been? Would he have had much of a church? A few thousand members? But he says, the Lord is long-suffering. He's not slack concerning his promise, but he's long-suffering. He is not willing that any perish. He's wanting to bring a multitude into the kingdom. Now, whether you believe in election, which means that the ones he's going to save are directly the elect, or whether you believe that it's all that would be saved, whether they're elected or not, the fact remains it's still the same truth. The reality is, he said, I am long-suffering, I'm patient, waiting for my kingdom and my people to be gathered. You know what the book of Isaiah says? Listen to this verse in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Therefore, he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. What does the Lord say? He says, I'm going to wait because I want to be gracious. You know, if the Lord hadn't waited, you'd have never been born. Aren't you glad he waited? We 
welcome you to Kingdom Living with Pastor Mark Byers. Let's get right to today's message as Pastor Mark continues his series, The Second Coming Reexamined. How big would the church have been if Jesus had come back in 50 A.D.? How big would the bride have been? Would he have had much of a church? A few thousand members? But he says, the Lord is long-suffering. He's not slack concerning his promise, but he's long-suffering. He is not willing that any perish. He's wanting to bring a multitude into the kingdom. Now, whether you believe in election, which means that the ones he's going to save are directly the elect, or whether you believe that it's all that would be saved, whether they're elected or not, the fact remains it's still the same truth. The reality is, he said, I am long-suffering, I'm patient, waiting for my kingdom and my people to be gathered. You know what the book of Isaiah says? Listen to this verse in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord will wait that he may be gracious to you. Therefore he will be exalted that he may have mercy on you. For the Lord is the God of justice. Blessed are those who wait for him. What does the Lord say? He says, I'm going to wait because I want to be gracious. Do you know if the Lord hadn't waited, you'd have never been born? Aren't you glad he waited? I am so thankful I've been born. And I'm so thankful I'm born again. And I'm so glad to be part of the kingdom of God and that I have an eternal existence that is going to be found in the presence of God in glory forever. I am so glad to be alive and I'm glad to be a king's child. I'm glad to be in the family of God. I'm glad I've got an eternal future. Thank you, Lord, that you were willing to wait patiently until I was born. I don't care how bad your life is. If you're a Christian and you're born again, you've got a wonderful future. There's coming a day when all your troubles and trials and persecutions and heartaches and loneliness is all going to be over. And you're going to stand in the presence of God in the glory of heaven. And you'll be there forever, never to die or sorrow. It's a wonderful thing to be alive. It's a wonderful thing to have life, not only in the flesh, but in the spirit and be a child of God. God said, I'm just going to wait until there's enough people. Because when he has his wedding, I guarantee you the wedding will be full. He's not going to have a little measly wedding. How many of you, don't raise your hands. Please don't raise your hands. But how many of you on your wedding day were a little bit nervous nobody might show up? Or maybe only four or five. I was. I didn't realize my wife had so many friends. We got married here in the church and this place was full. You know, but her folks just knew everybody. And then I, my family had a lot of friends and they came from all out of state and all over. I couldn't believe who showed up. And I, I kind of sighed and, I have guests at my wedding. I wasn't sure who would be here, who wouldn't be here. And when I perform a wedding for young couples, I I have a grief whenever there's only 30 people show up for the wedding. You can be sure that the the abundance of people, the book of Proverbs brings this out, and I don't remember the verse, and if somebody will look it up and can remember this one and find it while I'm preaching, I'll be glad to give it to you later. But the scriptures literally says that the glory of king is made manifest by the multitude of people. God has been waiting patiently to build the church. And it's taken him these... 2,000 years so that none would perish, that there would be a host of people brought into the kingdom. Jesus died on the cross to present to himself a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. And it's not going to be a mealy, little, weak, frail, half-dead, half-empty church. It's going to be full. And the wedding feast is going to be a glorious experience. To do it, he had to die on the cross. And when he died on the cross, I guarantee you this. That when he was separated from the Father for the very first time in his existence, that short three nights and three days was probably like 3,000. There have been people who have died. I know people who have died. I've talked to people who have died and been dead for a matter of a minute or two or three or four minutes. My brother's church, there was a medical doctor who was sitting in a light and he got killed. Somebody ran the light or somehow crashed into the side of his vehicle and he was killed instantly. And I don't want to go into all the details. He was dead. He was literally outside his car looking at his body. And as a medical doctor, he was examining his own body. And he knew why he was dead by just examining his own body. He was looking at himself. He went to meet with the Lord and the Lord sent him back and said, you have to go return for your wife and children. And the next thing he knew after, it it took him two hours. He shared the testimony in his church. Took two hours to tell what happened. 
And when he was back in the car, the people that were running towards the car to reach him had only taken like a half a step. Because time in heaven and time on earth are not the same. Things are moving so fast in heaven that a day in heaven is like a thousand years on the earth. A day on the earth, you know, we, we go through all this stuff in a day. When you get to heaven, it's like you've been there a thousand years because of the speed things are happening. When Jesus was separated from the Father for three days and three nights, it was like being separated from the Father for 3,000 years. It was a horrible experience for him. The Bible says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I guarantee you, if you love his appearing, your heart gets sick. And it gets sick because it waits. And unless I, unless I had understood, and, and if I didn't see that he was simply reaching out to bring in a multitude, I would say, Lord, why are you waiting? Put an end to this crazy world. He's going to. But he's looking to gather all the lost. Bernard of Clairvoy cried out and said, Dost thou call that a little while in which I will not see thee? Oh, this little while is such a long little while. If you really love his appearing, your heart cannot help but become sick. We need to really balance the word soon or quickly in the New Testament with the other statements in the New Testament that clearly indicate, and now we undoubtedly know it meant a long period of time between the first and second advent. Notice this. Just so you don't think that the New Testament left us with the impression it was going to happen right away, Matthew 24, 28, Jesus said, But if that evil servant says in his heart, My master is delaying his coming. This is in the parables regarding his return. Jesus said in Matthew 25, 5, But while the bridegroom was delayed, they all slumbered and slept. Matthew 25, 19, And after a long while, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. Jesus said, There's going to be a delay. It's going to be after a long while. There's going to be a delay in my coming. And they were slumbering and sleeping. Jesus gave the hint that it'll be a long time. We're going to see why he only gave a hint in a minute. Every one of those parables where he talks about the second coming, he interjects the thought of a long while. Well, let me just say this. I'll come back to it. How many of you know that Jesus didn't know the timing of his coming? Are you aware of that? He clearly said, I don't know. So, when he was saying a long while, he was hinting at the thought of a long while. He didn't declare it. He couldn't have declared it. He didn't know. He would have been being presumptuous to say more than that. In fact, at one point we're going to see, he left the disciples thinking for a moment that it could be soon. And yet he also let them thinking it could be a long while. He literally gave both ideas. It's a paradox in the New Testament. It's clearly a paradox that runs through the New Testament. The second coming is both near and far. But yet, when you read the scriptures, it is clearly established ultimately by the apostles at the end. It was far, 2,000 years away. How many of you remember that Jesus likened the second coming to a harvest? Did he? If he had likened it to a harvest, how many of you realized harvests don't grow quickly? And he said this, let both grow together until the harvest. James literally tells us in James chapter 5, verses 7 to 8, that, listen to this verse. Therefore be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. James knew it was going to be requiring patience. Now listen to what he goes on to say in James 5, 7 and 8. Until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the ground, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do you see that in both those scriptures, in, the, in that very same scripture, he gives both the idea of patience a long while and is at hand. He said, be patient. There's a harvest. It's going to take time. It's at hand, but it's going to take time. I think that the thing that is clear is the apostles began to realize at the end that it was two days away and that a day is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day. We have difficulty understanding the term long time in relation to the early church, but we don't have any difficulty understanding the term long time in the 21st century. Very quickly in the early church meant soon, but to us it means 2,000 years. 
I think the Lord allowed it to stand because it brings to bear on our lives now the fact that we are living for another day. Now notice what Peter says. Go back to Peter chapter 3. He tells them something that is an indication of something that is very important. How many of you, and I want you to raise your hands on this, how many of you have heard that the early church, we will get into this probably next week, how many of you have heard that the early church was taught Jesus was coming back right away? Raise your hand if you've heard that. Now, I want, listen, that's all that's heard that Jesus was coming back, the early church thought Jesus. Let me ask that question again. How many of you have heard taught that the early church expected Jesus to return in their lifetime? Raise your hands. Okay, most of you. Do you know that Peter was told before the cross he was going to die on a cross? If Peter believed he would live to see the second coming, he literally did not believe the very words of Jesus. Because Peter was told in John 21 that he would die on a cross. And if Peter believed he would live to see that, he doubted the very words of Jesus to his own life. And then in 1 Peter he writes, he said, My decease is about at hand, and I'm writing this thing to bring you to remembrance so that when I'm dead, you'll have something to refer to. Do you think Peter thought he was going to see the second coming? Peter knew he was going to die. Here's another one. How many of you know that Paul knew that he too was going to die? And he writes about it, and I'll give you that verse next week. These men were not looking that the day of the Lord was at hand. They knew they were going to die. They knew they weren't going to see the coming. There are verses I will point out to you that shows that. They were not expecting the Lord soon. They were expecting him in a good time off. Peter, he says something here, and he, there are two things that these scoffers are presenting. Look, look back with me. Two areas, two thoughts that they're putting out. Notice what he says the scoffers are going to say in verse 4. Where is the promise of his coming? Now listen to this next phrase. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. That is called in our society the evolutionary principle of uniformitarianism. Uniformitarianism means that what's happening in the world has been consistently happening unendingly for millions and millions of years. You understand that? We are in a world order that never changes and that never changes in this way. The evolutionary process is going on right now and even though there's changes in the world because of evolution, the evolutionary process is uniform. It always goes on and on and on and it doesn't change. Peter literally says, in the last days there's going to be scoffers who say, all things have continued on as they were from the beginning of creation. Do you realize that concept wasn't even heard of until 1850? No one believed that in 1600. It was Darwin who presented the idea. So the kind of scoffer that Peter says is going to come forth literally didn't even exist until our generation. And Peter says... Well, there's just one thing about those boys they don't realize. There used to be another world here, and it was destroyed. Things have not always continued as they were from the beginning of creation. There was a world that was destroyed. Now, whether you believe it's the flood of Noah, or whether you believe it's a flood under the pre-Adamic, the fact remains there was an interruption of natural phenomenon, and all things have not continued as they always were from the beginning of creation. The idea of uniformitarianism is false. We are in a creation where God said one day, I'm interrupting things. Smash! No more creation. All the people in Noah's day, they said, oh, it'll never rain. It's never happened. It's never rained. It's not gonna, this guy's a nut. And they must have made Noah the Epcot sinner of the day. Man, look at this crazy man building this boat in the middle of the desert. What's he think? There's going to be water? There's not going to be any water? This is stupid. He's foolish. He's a dummy. Let's come and laugh at him. Let's go see what the crazy man's doing today. And for 120 years, they mocked him. You know, those people are amazing to me. When all the animals started to walk into that boat, I would have been saying, wait a minute, no, you... What, what, were, what were you saying is going to happen? If 
I'd have been Noah, I'd have been looking at them and say, don't believe me, but just tell me one thing, how long can you swim? <laughs> or better yet, how long can you tread water without food? One day it happened. Their idea of uniformitarianism didn't last. It did change. And Peter says, they are willingly ignorant of the fact that there was a day that God interrupted the world and brought judgment. And he's going to do the same thing. But the reason he's waiting is because he wants to bring in a host of saints, which is included in us today. Peter does not define the looking for the coming of the Lord as a pre-tribulation rapture. He defines it as being aware that the Lord is going to come as a thief by surprise. And those who are not properly waiting are going to be taken by surprise. I would like you to look in your Bibles with me just real quickly at a number of scriptures concerning the thief in the night. How many of you know that the Bible tells us that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the dead in Christ shall rise first, and we which are alive and remain are going to be caught up? It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 15, and it says it this way. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, verse 51. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, that means in the blink of an eye, in the time it takes you to blink your eye, the rapture will be over. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put in corruption, and this mortal must put in immortality. What he's saying there, in the moment, in a twinkling of an eye, in an instant, this second coming of Christ will be over. Blinking an eye, it'll be done. That's how fast it's going to happen. Taking that verse, Bible teachers with a pre-trib position go over to the verse in Thessalonians, where it says that he's going to come as a thief in the night and turn, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians. And they say that, see, he comes as a thief as a total shock to everyone. Now, this idea of him coming as a thief in the night is applied to a surprise coming in the moment in the twinkling of an eye. No one's expecting it, not even the Christian, and all of a sudden we're gone. And then there's a seven-year tribulation. We know from Matthew 24, 43 that Jesus said that if the good man of the house had known in the watch the thief would come, he would have watched. Now, the first time the idea of a thief being introduced, Jesus introduces it, and he gives a key. He said, if the good man of the house would have known when the thief was coming, he would have been watching. Now, why do you watch for a thief if you aren't going to be able to see him when he comes anyway? What was Jesus saying? He was saying there's going to be two kinds of people. There's going to be people who watch and there's going to be people who don't watch. And so over and over, he says, watch, watch, watch. You know, if you're watching for a thief to come, it's rather fruitless to watch if you can't see him anyway. What are you watching for, thief? How do you know he's coming? Well, I can't see him. Well, what are you watching for? Well, I don't know. What are you looking for? I don't know what I'm looking for. Well, do you have any lights on? No, I don't have any lights on. Do you have binoculars? No, I don't have binoculars. Do you have any night vision? No, I don't have any night vision. Well, what are you watching for? I don't know. He's coming as a thief, but I don't even know what I'm watching for. What does Jesus say? When he comes as a thief, there are going to be people who are watching and people who aren't watching. Why do you watch? So it doesn't take you by surprise. That word watch, we'll see this next week literally means like an army on his watch, waiting, waiting for someone to come. Luke 12, 39 says, And this know, if the good men of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. Same thing as Matthew 24. But then we come to 1 Thessalonians 5. Now look at this scripture. We see in verse 13 through 18, the rapture. Listen, I don't know anybody that doesn't agree that this is the rapture. Verse 16, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, I'm sorry I didn't tell you this, but go back to 1 Corinthians 15, if you will, just one moment. 1 Corinthians 15, 51. I want you to see something. He says in 15, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, the dead will be raised incorruptible. So what we see is that in 1 Corinthians 15, there's a mystery that we're not all going to sleep, but we're going to be changed. It's going to happen in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound. In Thessalonians, chapter 4, 
He says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Now let me say this, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. I don't know anybody who doesn't agree that both those scriptures are referring to the same event. Are you listening? Both those scriptures refer to the same event. 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, at the sound of the last trumpet, that's the same event as 1 Thessalonians 4, where it says, the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together to meet them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so forth. Now, look at chapter 5. But concerning the times, brethren, and the seasons, how many of you realize that means the times and the years? You have no need that I should write you. For you yourselves know perfectly. Now listen, by this point, when Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, they knew this fact. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. Now look, don't get a headache here. Don't read into this anything. Just believe what it says. Don't try to see some deep truth here. It's just plain. The Lord is going to come back as a thief in the night. He said, you all know that. You know that perfectly well. How do they know it? Because Jesus told them that his coming would be like a thief. But Jesus told them that when his coming would be like a thief, they would be doing something. What were they supposed to be doing? Watching. And so he says, but you know perfectly well that the day of the Lord shall come as a thief in the night. For when they say, now wait a minute, who are they? When they say, peace and safety, what's going to happen to them? Then sudden destruction comes upon them. Are you realizing that he's talking about somebody other than the Christians? He's saying when they say, when the ungodly say, peace and safety. Incidentally, if you have any eyes to see, there has never been a time in the history of the world where the word peace and safety is used more than it is in the news today. When they say peace and safety, then what happens? Sudden destruction comes on them. How does it come? As labor pains upon a pregnant woman and they shall not escape. I'm the father of five kids. And you know what I noticed about labor pains? They started with no warning. Middle of the night. Honey, honey, what? <laughs> Wake up. Why, why, why? It's time. It's time. Well, when it was the first one, it was like, time! Time! Oh, oh, you know. <laughs> and you put on one sneaker and one black shoe, you know, and you're out the door. <laughs> After the second one, we slowed up, and by the third one, it was like, you ready? Yeah, okay, I'm ready, you know. <laughs> Some people goof off and only find themselves having the baby on the way in the car because they're so confident that it's plenty of time. But this says that the second coming is going to be like labor pains for one group of people. The people who aren't watching. The people who are going to be destroyed. Then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. They shall not escape. Let me say this. It doesn't say sudden tribulations coming on them. That's not what that said. The idea is that this rapture takes place and then there's seven years of tribulation period where the wicked are just hammered and crushed and hammered and hammered. That's not what Paul says here. He says when this takes place, sudden destruction. You know what the idea of destruction is? They're annihilated. Not seven years of tribulation. Sudden destruction. Not, not slow seven-year process of three and a half years of safety and peace with an Antichrist. And then there's this, this Antichrist who violates his covenant. And then there's a three and a half year period. And at, during that three and a half year period, after three and a half years of peace, he's going to really start pouring out lies. And he's going to do all this deceitful little dirty work. That's not what he said. He said that when the rapture takes place, it's going to come on the wicked like labor pains on a woman and they will not escape, but sudden, sudden destruction is coming on them. You have to already have read Schofield, and Walvoord, and a whole bunch of other books and people who bought into that whole scheme to ever interpret that verse to mean there's a seven year period with three and a half years of peace before the sudden destruction. When he comes as a thief in the night, sudden, sudden destruction comes on the wicked. And what does Peter tell us later? 
he tells us that in the day it happens, the earth is destroyed. Thank you for listening to Kingdom Living, sponsored by Calvary Christian Church in Royal Oak, Michigan.